Okay, we are live on Facebook. So now we're gonna, oh man, nope, didn't wanna do that. Add a little Zoom. Very professional here. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Uh, my name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education here at the National First Ladies Library and Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. And I am so excited um, for our event today. Today we're actually celebrating Women's Equality Day, which marks the 1920, 1920 certification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. The passage of the 19th Amendment is just one victory in the struggle for voting rights for all people, as well as the struggle for women's equality. We spent much of our year discussing some of the superheroes involved with the struggle for um, that 19th Amendment passage, including Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, Ida B. Wells, and even recently Shirley Chisholm as we thought about the presidential election and Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, today we're going to pivot to discuss some other real life superheroes. Um, we're going to be talking about Wonder Woman. But first, um, I want to remind you that we are streaming on Facebook Live today. We are also on Zoom. Um, hopefully, it looks like we've got participants in the room. If you have questions today, please enter them into Facebook or the Zoom chat, and I am happy to answer them. If you have any issues hearing me um, or any technical issues, we can try to troubleshoot those as well. But the first thing I want to do is mention some of our upcoming programs. So next week, September 2nd, we have a really amazing program. Um, if you're familiar with him, a little further to the south, um, one of the better known uh, Akron celebrities besides LeBron James and Chrissy Hine is David Giffel, um, so called the Bard of Akron by the New York Times. We are going to have him here to celebrate the um, new book that he has just released called Barnstorming Ohio to understand America. Uh, he spent a year traveling around to different places in Ohio, kind of taking the temperature of Ohio um, and its role in the very important upcoming presidential election. One of the things he did in one of the chapters is actually visit our site. So we're really excited to have him here to discuss it with him. And our program is gonna be kind of a unique rollout because he's gonna actually um, be in discussion with his daughter, Leah who is also featured in the book, talking about her role as a first time voter in the 2016 election. So I don't think he's ever done this with his one of his children before. I'm super excited about it. And I hope that you will join us for that event. Um, this kind of is kicking off a new little film series as we're thinking about COVID and remote programs. How can we deliver films to you? So this Wonder Woman is our first and hopefully a series of events. We are going to actually be working with Stark Library as our partners in the future. And they have this great um, little thing called Hoopla, which you can use your Stark Library card to connect to the library and take out a lot of amazing films for free. So for next month, we're actually going to be um, featuring the film She Did That. It's an amazing um, film that actually debuted in, on Netflix not that long ago about um, Black female entrepreneurs. And we are working with Canton Girl Gang to connect with two really amazing women. Um, we are super excited to have them here. Um, and they're Whitney Prather and Corey Minor Smith. And um, if you're not familiar with Corey, I've actually not met her yet because I'm not a Canton local, but Corey was the first at-large um, city council person um, who was African-American. So we're super excited to have a groundbreaking woman in politics here. Um, 
uh, at our site for that discussion of the film, She Did That. So two really great Black female entrepreneurs coming up to discuss the film, and that's on September 30th. So you can go on our Facebook page or Eventbrite to connect with those programs, and we will get you all of the information you need to screen them on Hoopla. So my hope is today that you got a chance to screen Wonder Woman, The Untold Story of American Superheroines. If you didn't, um, we're going to show you um, the um, preview in just a moment to kind of give you a little background information on the film. Um, but again, it's still accessible through the link we provided through the weekend. Um, so hopefully you can do that. And this woman is sitting with us today. Um, I'm very excited to um, introduce to you uh, Christy Guevara Flanagan, the director of the film. Christy has been making documentary and experimental films for nearly two decades, starting with a 1999 experimental documentary about a blow up doll. Her first feature film, Going on 13 from 2009, covers four years in the lives of four adolescent girls. It premiered at the Tribeca Film Fest and was broadcast on PBS. Christy also produced and directed several short films, including El Torido de Cecilia Rios from 1999, which chronicles the violent death of 15-year-old Cecilia Rios. It was an official selection of the Sundance Film Festival and subsequently broadcast on the Sundance Channel. Her feature, Wonder Woman, The Untold Story of American Superheroines from 2013, traces the evolution and legacy of comic book hero Wonder Woman as a way to reflect on society's anxieties about women's liberation. The film garnered numerous awards, premiered at the South by Southwest Film Fest, and was broadcast on PBS series Independent Lens in 2013. Her recent short, What Happened to Her, premiered at Hot Docs Canadian Film Fest, where it received an honorable mention for best shorts. What Happened to Her, um, and her in-progress feature documentary, Body Parts, continues her exploration on the themes of gender and representation. Christie's work has been funded by ITVS, the Sundance Institute, Tribeca Institute, Latino Public Broadcasting, California Humanities, and she is now an associate professor at UCLA. So Christy, we are so excited to have you here today. Um, there's a lot to talk about, but I wanted to show everyone um, the preview of the film just so they would get a chance to see that. So I have it queued up and then we'll start our discussion if that sounds good. Perfect. Okay, let's see. Spider-Man. Superman. Batman. Like all the classics. Batman. You know what I'm saying? Batman is dope. Here's Batman. Spider-Man. Superman. Clark Kent. What are the consequences for women when they are strong and when they are the central actors of their own lives and not content to be in the shadows and to be the supporting characters? the only female superhero, so she was irresistible. She was literally the only game in town. She believed that you didn't need a man to take care of you. She had her crush on Steve Trevor, but she didn't need him. He actually needed her. The early Wonder Woman are some of the most feminist stories in comics. Wonder Woman emerged, women had to step out of the private sphere into the public sphere because we were at war. Women did things they had never done before. They made planes and they flew the planes and they became superheroines. 
But as soon as the war ended, all the guys wanted their jobs back and the women were sent back to the kitchen and suddenly there was a mass amnesia and no one remembered that women had ever been strong. With Wonder Woman, you begin to see her adventures turn more to romance. She spent many, many, many years not being a feminist character at all. It was like the perfect time for Wonder Woman to come back. And of course, when she came back, she came back in the new media, the media of the 70s, which was TV. They did not think that a woman could carry a show. Well, we proved them wrong and made a lot of money for the network, a lot of money. I loved Wonder Woman. We twirled around and we thought that we might become Wonder Woman. In the 90s, we were being told that feminism didn't exist right as we found it. Starting with the Riot Girl movement, girls who grew up with Wonder Woman and Charlie's Angels through punk rock music and handmade zines are taking the images that we grew up with and dissecting how they've influenced us as women. It's about making your own media. <laughs> start out our discussion just by asking you what inspired you to make this film? Um, I had grown up with the Wonder Woman TV show and I for me it really was a revelation when I was a kid there was nothing else like it at the time that was fun and I could envision myself as the main character kicking butt, you know, and kind of taking action as opposed to being saved. Um, but what really inspired me to look deeper, more deeply into Wonder Woman as a kind of an, an interesting character, uh-oh, um, is reading a New York Times article about um, Gail Simone, who was uh, gonna be writing the Wonder Woman comic book. And one thing the article mentioned was that a woman had never actually written that character in comic book form. And I just thought that was such a weird anomaly because she really is this icon for female empowerment. And yet she was created by a man and had been, you know, authored by men for her entire career. And something in that conundrum just felt really ripe for exploration in um, a lot of issues with pop culture and representation and who we think of as heroes. So I, I actually grew up think watching repeats of Linda Carter and I remember my sister and I for the 4th of July wearing Wonder Woman costumes and just spinning around and how fun that was so I definitely connected but I did not know the history uh, so it was really great to dig into that um, since the the film has been released the Wonder Woman big budget film has been released and we were just talking about the authorship of Wonder Woman. The film um, when it was released was the first I think superhero movie ever directed by um, a woman that was a big budget superhero film, Patty Jenkins. So um, what did you think when you saw the film? What was your take on it? Well, a lot has changed in this superhero era um, er area since I made this film and the Wonder Woman 
part two, the feature film is coming out, I believe, you know, as soon as they can figure out how to release it. Um, it's called 1984. Mm -hmm. And we also have Black Panther. So the film also looks at how, you know, well, we don't have a lot of people of color that are superheroes and we don't have, you know, disabled characters who are superheroes, which seem like they would be the perfect people to become superheroes um, because of their experiences. And so things, things have changed. Um, Pat, that film definitely, um, led the way and then Black Panther came out and I think both are wonderful. Um, you know, they're not perfect either one, but we just, you know, we just need mm -hmm. options really. We need options and we need options created by women um, and people of color. Um, now we have the first superhero film directed by a black woman. So Gina Prince Bythewood directed, I haven't seen it yet. Storm, I think it is. Um, no, not Storm. I'm blanking on the name, but uh, I hear, you know, good things about that film as well. And she's um, very intentional in, uh, as Patty Jenkins was just, you know, knowing the weight that they carry on their shoulders for being a first. And, you know, there were, there were aspects of the film that I loved. Um, I particularly loved all the stuff on Paradise Island and with the other female characters. And then, you know, I was a little disappointed that there weren't any, she didn't have enough kind of female friendships in the kind of present day moments that were in the film. But um, I look forward to seeing what happens with the second Wonder Woman film. So your film begins by following the history of Wonder Woman. And what I really loved was you interviewed so many remarkable women, including Gloria Steinem and um, Kathleen Hanna, Kathleen Hanna of the um, 1990s Riot Girl movement, if people aren't familiar. And I hadn't really considered um, the role that as, you kind of track Wonder Woman's history in the film, um, Wonder Woman starts out as this really powerful character and as time changes and um, women go back into from um, being in the factories and working during World War II and kind of like transition to suburban housewife, the role of Wonder Woman changes as well. And I did not realize the role that women like Gloria Steinem had in kind of really changing Wonder Woman. Um, and also yeah. with Riot Girl really reclaiming it. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit um, for those out there who haven't seen the film yet about that. Mm -hmm. I did not know about that history as well. And when I first uh, started making the film and doing research, I just began connecting these dots that were very unlikely to me. So I didn't even know that Wonder Woman was basically as old as Superman. She was created in the forties, um, uh, had a very interesting origin, was made, created by a man, but kind of a um, very singular man, William Moulton Marston, who had uh, a lot of proto-feminist thoughts um, about what a woman can do. And, and there's been much um, sort of <clears throat> people thinking that that had something to do with the power of his um, wife and he could be his own film. And in fact, there is another film that is about him and his wife and another woman. I'll leave it at that. Uh, you can look it up. And, um, and then, uh, and so Gloria Steinem had grown up with this kind of 1940s Wonder Woman, late 40s Wonder Woman comic book. And immediately, you know, Wonder Woman was the only game in town if you were a girl and liked comic books. Um, and so it had influenced her and very naturally when she started, uh, her magazine and they were thinking about an icon, um, to put on one of their very early magazines. Um, I think technically it was the second issue because the first issue was like a prototype 
they put Wonder Woman on the cover. And that was because she's just a figure that captures our imagination. Um, a strong, powerful woman, again, not a sidekick, you know, at the center of the narrative. And so in the 70s, when they did this, um, Gloria Steinem went back to look at the comics um, of Wonder Woman. And at that time, Wonder Woman was very a very ridiculous character. Um, William Moulton Marston had long since passed and a lot of men because comic books at that time were, you know, still very much an area where men were working primarily. Had no superpowers, was kind of like this um, spy character. And so she wrote to them and demanded that they reinstate her to her kind of original intentions, which is to be a superhero, not just like a spy. And she was the owner of a clothing boutique too at that time. And so to kind of get rid of that. And, um, and Gloria Steinem has continued, well, had continued through to the eighties to work with people who were working on um, iterations of Wonder Woman in comic book form. And so this idea of connecting the dots of kind of popular heroism, you know, popular cultural heroism and feminism, um, you know, I was looking for something a little bit more current, uh, recent than the 80s. And when I started looking at the Riot Girl movement and their early zines, they were using images of Wonder Woman as well. And they were maybe a little bit more sarcastic at times um, because, you know, even the Linda Carter version of Wonder Woman was dressed very uh, ridiculously, you could say. And there was a lot of camp. Um, there's still something meaningful in her as a superhero when there's just no other female superheroes that we recognize. Um, so they started using her likeness in the zines that they were making and, and repurposing a lot of um, these cultural icons for their own brand of feminism. So again, this was a way I could kind of connect the dots to how Wonder Woman has been relevant throughout um, throughout the decades. And, you know, I made the film before the feature film came out, kind of hot, they were hot on my heels. <laughs> um, and so her legacy lives on, you know, in interesting ways. Um, another thing just connecting to that that was really interesting about the documentary is how you animated a lot of those comic book pieces or with the Riot Girl zines, they're kind of cut and paste and you get that feel for the DIY of it. Um, but I also loved the, the interviews you had with people and um, there's one woman who's the psychologist who's actually on a horse, horseback riding as she's talking about um, female heroines and young girls. And she says, um, you know, growing up, everyone who was having fun was a man. I wonder if you can speak to the influence of, of super heroines on young girls. Well, it's part of um, opening up our imagination to possibility and potential. And when it's, it's not that I think that um, there aren't, very important real life women heroes. I just for, you know, for young people, they're consuming a lot of pop culture and um, they want their imagination to be opened up where they can be the hero of their own story in some fantastical way. And when there aren't a lot of options, it's again, very limiting. Um, I think women and as people of color also are used to uh, sort of identifying with many characters, right? We identify partly with the male characters and partly with the female sidekicks because usually women, you know, have not traditionally been the main heroes or the main protagonists even. Um, but having us be at the center, 
having girls be at the center, or women at the center of the story where they can, again, be the ones saving the day. It's just so powerful, you know? Um, you can't, if you can't see it, how can you believe it? You know, how can you, you're, you're gonna end up waiting for your prince to come, right? And rescue you, because there's, who knows, you know, how many fairy tales that have that story and that myth. Um, and I have a daughter right now who's eight and, you know, thankfully there's um, a lot of options now out there and you still have to curate, right? Because if you just go toward the mainstream, it's still, um, the numbers aren't great um, for cartoon characters all the way up to adult characters. I have two sons and I'm always kind of curating with them too. And it, it's really interesting to see like which power ranger my five-year-old will choose. If he'll choose the pink ranger or the yellow ranger. Um, and sometimes he does gravitate towards those female characters. So that's really exciting to me. Um, the other really interesting interview in the film was another parent. Um, so you talked to a woman who grew up on watching Linda Carter as Wonder Woman and you at one point you're in a tattoo parlor with her and she's getting this amazing tattoo and um, she talks about um, being an immigrant, being a working parent and that influence of the Wonder Woman as like the woman having it all. And I, especially right now during COVID when women are balancing work, they're balancing education for their children, all of these things. I wonder if you could expand upon that experience as, as Wonder Woman, um, women taking on that role in their daily lives. Mm. Yeah, well, one thing I wanted to do with the film, again, to make it um, relevant to today is profile people that found inspiration in Wonder Woman. And so I have basically three characters that do that. One is a young girl with a stutter who um, just, you know, becomes enraptured with the comics and finds meaning in that. And a gay man who collects Wonder Woman material and um, uses her as a, a fundraiser uh, for domestic violence charities, kind of a, you know, like a big larger comic book event at a comic book store. And then there's uh, the Carmela, who's the mom, single mom, raising her daughter, um, came to this country and was kind of on her own. So I think she saw in that a very close kinship. And it's interesting that Wonder Woman in comic book form was very popular in Latin America, in South America and Mexico. Um, I think you can interpret her because of her dark hair, at least as, you know, she's not blonde, <laughs> um, as, as potentially being, uh, you know, of, of their culture. And, she is an immigrant. She comes here and has to figure out this world. Uh, what does it mean, this man's world? Um, she came from an island of women. And uh, so there, I think there's some interesting um, readings that can be made where you can see her as a heroine for immigrant rights and civil rights um, because she kind of comes here and she was always into reforming villains and compassion. You know, a lot of her stories, not all of them, um, because she's been in comic book form written for decades now, since the 40s, she's been, um, you know, they've been writing her every month. So there's lots of different versions of her, but largely the main version is that she is um, very global minded uh, because of her status as an immigrant and um, you know she comes from kind of a Greek-ish story uh, origin story uh, though it's fictional but this ideal and uh, this idea of Amazons that's right a Greek myth and um, 
she's compassionate. Uh, that's one of her main strengths. So she's a enduring superhero in that way. And I think has a lot of potential for our particular times in that, in that way. And, you know, a lot of people just know her as a t-shirt or a mug. Um, you know, I got my wonder mug and, um, but there's a reason beyond that, you know, that, that is fitting and it's great to see her being adapted to the big screen now um, for that reason. I don't know if I answered your question, I kind of forgot. Oh, I think you did. <laughs> Remembering, um, last year I went to a women's equality baseball game and there was a woman there dressed up as Wonder Woman and she was voter girl getting people registered to vote. So, Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> awesome. We took a bunch of photos with her, so it was really fun. Um, I mean, I think that still to this day, the two biggest icons for female empowerment are Rosie the Riveter and Wonder Woman. Like if you're gonna just in terms of um, identification in kind of a instant, right? Like, what does it mean? So in the film, you start with Wonder Woman and you kind of follow this history of Wonder Woman and then you transition to um, other pop, pop culture icons and this idea of women superheroines kind of spreading, but um, a lot of, continual struggles and one of the ones I was fascinated with you kind of get into the 80s and the the um really hyper masculine superheroes and action movies and um the movie Thelma and Louise and that idea which I believe was directed by a man but um that idea that some of these women who are heroes end up dying. So um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Xena Warrior Princess, they're like too good for this world and they have to give their lives. And as I was reading your bio and the films that you're, you've been working on and making since that film, they kind of build on that theme. So um, the image of the dead woman on like Law and Order SBU or that, that fascination that we have with women in death and um, film media. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit to that. I, you're absolutely right. I'm somewhat obsessed with this, even though I don't really consciously think about it that much, but it becomes uh, a, a place where I investigate in my film and art. Um, you know, I think in the superhero realm, it's this idea of sacrifice and women are often seen as um, martyrs and being uh, like that the most they can do is sacrifice their own life. And so Xena is a, gosh, a great example. I mean, there's no reason she needed to die. It's like she was really popular. People loved her. Um, if you haven't seen Xena Warrior Princess, she's worth checking out. She had, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, a great female relationship with her, her sidekick in that, in that show. Um, and so to me, the interpretation of that is that there is no vision for a woman lasting that's going to be in this heroic role, that she will eventually have to sacrifice herself or um, occasionally get killed. Um, because it's like we can't even imagine the legacy and the the her carrying on forever because we live in a patriarchy <laughs> um it does make some sense that uh women may not last under those conditions but i think in terms of popular culture it's been very limiting to have them all killed off i mean Thel Thelma and louise Another great example, they are flying in their cars off the cliff at the end of the film because there is no real world for them to exist in under the conditions under which they demand to exist. So again, that gives us, you know, we, we read into those as we watch those and to see all these women sacrificing themselves or killing themselves um, is not a great message, right? Because it doesn't 
give us space to see us continuing and living up to those heroic standards. Uh, so, um, and Wonder Woman never kills herself, which is great. Good, good on that, Wonder Woman. <laughs> Um, in, in other realms, we have it, like the, the film that I, the short film that I made, What Happened to Her, looks at um, our fetishization of the dead female body. And that's kind of a different thing that was similar and just this fascination with um, and sexualization of dead women and I think that is about um, this idea of, and, th and that's usually a white woman, a young, pretty white woman, um, like the sacrificial virgin, or um, this idea that white womanhood is what, um, you know, the, the is symbolic of what, Aryan nations are fighting to protect. Um, so that when that is, that white woman is killed or murdered or something horrible happens to her, it's uh, kind of like a plot point to kick off um, a bunch of usually men to try to solve that crime or that murder because the stakes are so high when that particular figure, this, um, figure that was supposed to be protected is killed. I haven't quite developed great theories about that beyond it, um, beyond the, you know, clearly an interest in voyeuristically looking at this dead female body that's very different than looking at a dead male body. Like you don't even, the camera never lingers on that. They get like half a second of them just lying there dead. But a dead woman is definitely portrayed very differently. So yeah, a lot of fascinating things going on with um, dead women in our culture and disturbing. Um, with that, I wanted to sort of change the subject or transition to talking about um, Hollywood and being a female director. So we've kind of gone through this great reckoning that uh, seems to be continuing related to um, women and discrimination in film and entertainment industry. I wanted to see like, did you experience any specific difficulties being a female director and specifically like being a director of documentaries, is it a more freeing area of the filmmaking industry to be in? Or is it equally, um, are you equally faced with discrimination? So I will say in the documentary area, you see a lot more women directors. Um, I think it's not as uh, tough for women directors. I think the stakes are so much smaller, the budgets are smaller, the profits are way smaller. Um, you know, you're lucky to get a salary if you're directing a documentary. So it has been a space where women have been able to um, travel. And I think a lot of women with aspirations to direct bigger projects have, um, you know, landed in documentary because they're, they have not been greenlit for bigger budget films. And again, that's why Patty Jenkins directing this, you know, multi-million dollar budget is such a big deal because women are just not given those opportunities. And so I, I haven't faced um, like forward facing discrimination, but you know, what most women directors, both in documentary and, you know, particularly in fiction, see is that they, the doors are not open <laughs> to them. Like they're not allowed in the room. They're not get, they don't get the meetings, you know, I'm not, I've directed many documentary features and I'm not, you know, at Netflix pitching or making big budget documentaries and documentaries are um, seen as profitable right now on these different streaming platforms. Now the subject of those documentaries still tend to be either celebrity or crime, kind of true crime. Mm -hmm. Maybe those are areas I'm not necessarily wholly interested in. Um, though I could think of some celebrities that I would love to <laughs> make films about. Uh, so, you know, I'm not 
asked to the table. Um, and so that's the kind of discrimination that I think uh, women directors face. Are there and is there any advice that you have for another thing that the film features as some young women um, making films? Is there any advice that you have for women trying to break into the business? And also, like, are there any really great documentaries that you think are under the radar that are made by women that people should see? Oh my gosh, um, I gotta think about that one because yes, uh, so. You know, I think the the film kind of ends with, um, you know, it, I don't want to end any of my films with grimness or bleakness. So we want to be positive and hopeful and uh, especially for the next generation and take the reins, you know, write the story. If you have to write it as a comic book, if you have to make the video and put it on YouTube, I think, you know, just start doing it and then start calling yourself a director or a writer or a creator. Just own that title, do it whatever way you can. That was something that was really empowering about the 90s uh, Riot Girl movement is that it was so scrappy. They invented the term DIY, do it yourself. And, um, you know, that is a space for women to uh, thrive in and I, you know, I hope that, um, that it's not just, that it, uh, my hope is that it doesn't have to be, you know, kind of a lone wolf scenario that you find collaboration and community in those spaces. And, and again, that's why the Riot Girl movement was powerful because they found each other and they got together and they were born out of, consciousness raising groups basically where women got together and talked about what um, struggles and challenges they had. So those are my two biz biggest things is get out there, start making it however you can, however scrappy, own the title of creator, director, author, artist, whatever it is that you wanna do. And then to try to find your community. Um, and uh, that, you know, then you can build upon each other's successes and find interesting ways to collaborate and you just don't find, feel isolated, which is, um, um, you know, psychologically draining. The tools are definitely more available for young women to make films and also like platforms thinking about TikTok and um, all of the ways that people can push things out today. So I almost see like there could be like a Riot Girl zine version of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in film today. Yeah, the tools are out there and it still pains me to see um, that they're, you know, the, the, a lot of the challenges are the same. I taught film production at a community college a few years ago. Now I'm at UCLA and you know, you get a group together and it's like the boys just, they don't even think twice about taking the reins and the women in a film production class were cast as the actors or in kind of meaningless roles. And I would see this just sort of natural tendency, natural, right, happen time and time again. And it takes a little elbow grease to not fall into those patterns even today or even you know in my daughter's classrooms um, I can see in athletics just on the playground the boys take up the space and my girl's like I don't want to shoot hoops with all those boys and she would get out there and the boys would just throw right over her head um, this is a very progressive city and progressive school. And there, it's just that idea of taking up space. Girls and women still need to be told and that space needs to be prioritized. There's, um, if, if people have questions, you can ask questions on uh, Facebook Live or in Zoom um, as we're kind of wrapping up our hour here. Um, there is a question in here, and we've kind of talked about uh, where we thought pop culture heroines were today, but like someone's asking, um, is Wonder Woman as a comic still being produced? It sounds like you kind of answered that, but is it written by women now? And I wanted to follow up on that because we've talked a little bit about race, 
And I am not a comic book or superhero expert, but I've kind of started getting sucked in because there are so many authors like Roxanne Gay and Tom Hasey Coates who are entering that superhero uh, writing realm. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit to that, like the contemporary uh, women comic book, Wonder Woman comic book, it's still happening, right? And about women and um, Black, Indigenous people of color as authors in this realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Wonder Woman is still being written. And, you know, the reason I started my film journey was because the first woman to write it in comic book form, Gail Simone, was um, writing it. And she is no longer writing Wonder Woman. She's definitely a woman to look out for in mainstream comics. She wrote another really great uh, female-centered um, comic called Birds of Prey that has, um, you know, it's about a group of women and one of them is disabled. And I think it's pretty interesting and edgy um, in that as, as much as it can be. Um, I don't know who's writing Wonder Woman right now. I, I don't believe it's a woman currently. Um, and I haven't read it in a while since, uh, in a couple years. So that's interesting. Uh, there was another um, mainstream superheroine that I thought was interesting. I believe it was, um, there was a version of Miss Marvel who was Muslim American. And we, my daughter and I read some of that and that was very interesting. And of course in um, TV and film, um, you know, you have Black Panther and that has also kicked off um, very interesting comic book versions of that story. Um, you have uh, Watchmen on TV on um, Netflix, which has taken a, uh, and is written, and uh, I don't know if it's directed, but in, in these series, it's the writing that can be very important. And the series producer are um, African-American and that has a very strong African-American storyline as well as Lovecraft, um, which is uh, just premiering now and is really, you know, was a novel um, written by an African-American and, um, is a very, very compelling storyline. Um, what else do we have? We have a lot of interesting YA, young adult material that, that uh, I have not seen that area do as good of a job with um, diversity, but there's a lot of strong female characters in young, in YA material, you know, kind of like the Hunger Games style and that gets, there's a new one out that's kind of, um, people are very excited about that those get created into <clears throat> popular franchises as well. Oh, there's a really fun question here. Um, I don't know about this trend with superheroes, but I keep thinking of um, the Nick Hornby book about the Rucker store where they just swapped in the male character with a black female character. So what do you think of the trend of male super of taking male superheroes and making films with them as female, I think is the question. Mm. Well, I, I definitely think with um, casting, that's a, a really interesting choice. Um, and particularly when it comes to race, I think it works, can work really well. The other series that did that was uh, um, Little Fires. Uh, it was originally written as, you didn't really know, but people assumed white women and, and um, one of the characters was cast African-American, not a superhero, but you know, kind of a larger than life story. I think there's great potential there and it's so simple. Um, you know, we wanna be careful of, uh, I think it's good to have both. So since there is so much material out there that's male dominated, yeah, switch it, switch it up and see what happens and what you come up with. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we want some female characteristics and traits to get in there. We don't just want, you know, guns and skirts. <laughs> uh, we want other options that might work for some people, um, you know, but there, there should be other options out there, so. 
I, I like the repurposing trend personally. I think it can be another question um, relates to this idea of like the superheroes being super sexy, sexualized when they're female. Um, and that kind of tension of like the women being really powerful, but kind of like, you know, being made into this sex object. Definitely, um, and my film grapples with that to some extent in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, when you first started seeing superheroines, um, they absolutely had to be over the top sexy. They were even very thin, which didn't make any sense. Like there was no musculature in the Bionic Woman or even Linda Carter. Um, and they were running, you know, Wonder Woman was running on a bathing suit, basically, and boots with heels. It didn't make a lot of sense. And so the interpretation that I have of that, of course, is that, you know, you have to appeal to male audiences. And that's what was thought that you have to do to appeal to male audiences. But on a kind of deeper level, it's a way of compromising their power. You know, they can't be superhero. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, another one. Like they have to be cute or sexy while they kick ass. Um, and I think that that's still something we're grappling with. It looks a little bit different now. Um, but uh, I would like to see less egregious examples of that for sure. And uh, to me, it's distracting uh, <laughs> and, and I'm like ridiculous. Um, and so it was, I think one of the characters in terms of superheroines that played against that early ones was Eleanor Ripley because she was not, I don't think she was overly sex, sexualized, um, especially for that time period. And so you get a real toughness and a real authenticity to that toughness. And you see, you know, you see examples of that here and there, but we still have the, the cute slash sexy superheroine, especially in the, you know, the Fantastic Four, when there's like an ensemble of superheroines, the Black Widow, they're like, the hottest stars, right? The sexiest stars, and you don't you don't get other options. So that's something still to fight against. And I think as we get more female writers and creators and directors that are pushing back against that. I wanted to return um, to that documentary question. If you have any like further ideas, I don't want to put you on the spot, but of documentaries that are. Uh, female documentary makers who are worth checking out? Um, uh, well, there's a good, interesting series, Orthodox, about Jewish women, um, and it's pretty empowering that I thought was good. Um, Ramona Diaz is a filmmaker uh, that I really admire. She made this great film called Believer um, about when a journey looks for a new front man many years after the fact for kind of a comeback to her and they hire this amazing Filipino American. And she has a new film out that's making the rounds. It's called A Thousand Cuts, a very political film that um, you can find online, I believe. Um, and she also made a beautiful film called Motherland, Motherland that's about a maternity center in the Philippines that's just um, amazing. Um, Penny Lane made a film, very enjoyable film called Hail Satan about Satanists. And it turns out they're very politically active, they're political activists in kind of their newest versioning of themselves. And, and she's a filmmaker I admire a lot, has made a lot of films. Um, uh, so many. Um, oh, uh, uh, that's a trans man. Um, I always show Strong Island in my, I think it's particularly timely right now. It's made by a trans man though, Yancey Ford. Um, but it's a very important film um, that looks at a police, uh, at the murder of, of black men and um, 
how, you know, since time began here in the United States, uh, it has been unrecognized uh, officially as a problem by the police and the sort of left communities to fend for themselves in terms of seeking justice. So those are a few. Thank you. Maybe, maybe more I can follow up in text. <laughs> I think about it. I think you've given us a lot to keep us uh, busy for the next few months at home. Uh, so really, thank you for that. And Christy, I want to thank you for your time today. If you're just tuning in or catching the end of this, I've been chatting with uh, Christy Guevara Flanagan, um, director of an amazing documentary about Wonder Women and um, we are so happy to have you here today. And again, if you haven't had a chance to check out the film, um, please register for our event. And we have that open, I think, through the weekend for you to watch. Um, it's also available through the Stark Library. And we are teaming up with the Stark Library for next month's film called She Did That. So please um, join us for that as well. So I wanna thank Christy for joining us today for this discussion and encourage you all to check out the film. Thanks so much, Christy. My pleasure and uh, happy Women's Equality Day, everyone. Yay, happy Women's Equality. I've got my yellow roses on my uh, jacket here. So go out and uh, celebrate uh, equality and superheroines out there. And thank you so much, Christy. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Allison.